Well, today on That's Classic, I, I have, I, I mean, I have personal favorites. I'm sorry, guys, but I do. But today, I definitely have a personal favorite. Today, we have none other than Burt Ward, who played Robin on Batman. And uh, we're going to talk today with Burt about his amazing career and the stories. I'm telling you, this Burt is incredible. Uh, Burt, thanks for being here. Well, hello, citizen. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I, I got to tell you, Bert, right out of the gates, one of the things that I'd love to talk about is the stunts that you did on Batman. I mean, I was reading, I was listening to your things. I couldn't believe it. I mean, what can you tell the fans a little bit about what, why you were doing the stunts and some, some of the stunts that you had to perform that were so dangerous? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, I had no idea I was going to be doing them. And, uh, I had no idea how dangerous they were going to be. <laughs> uh, and I didn't have any idea how many times I'd be going to the emergency hospital with second degree burns, broken noses, and, and just in gas inhalation from penguins' umbrellas. I mean, it was quite uh, an experience. And uh, it, it, it started on day one with my really? very first shot on day one, which we, we filmed up in Bronson Canyon. Um, and this is the famous scene of the Batmobile coming out of the Batcave, you know, it comes mm -hmm. out of the Batcave and the sign goes down and, you know, we make this fast turn and, you know, go off to Gotham City. Anyway, oh, yeah. so this was, uh, oh, we had to be there like at 6 or 6.30 in the morning, makeup and, you know, costume and all of that. And then at about 7 a.m., they said, Bert, we want you to go into the cave here because uh, we've got the Batmobile there and this is the scene where you're going to be driving out. It's going to be the opening scene of the show every week and, you know, it's always going to be used. So it's a very important scene and you're going to come out and, you know, in the Batmobile. I said, sure, you know, I didn't know anything else. So I went yeah. into the cave, which is kind of dark, to be honest with you. I've and been there. I, it is. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and uh, here I'm kind of fumbling around. And I found the Batmobile. And I got in and I, and I saw what I thought was Adam. And I said, Adam, and he said, no, this is Hubie. And, I, and he's dressed in a, in, a, in a Batman outfit. And I said, oh, well, 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 what are you doing here? So, well, I'm a stunt man, and this is a very dangerous stunt, and the studio doesn't want to take a chance of Adam West getting hurt. So they hired me to do it. I said, oh, well, that's good, you know? And uh, I started, and I said, well, this is a dangerous stunt? He said, oh, absolutely. I said, why is that? Oh, we got to come out at 55 miles an hour. And this is on dirt coming out at 55 oh miles gosh. an hour. We have to, when we get right at the camera, I've got to make a sharp left turn, skid the rear tires around and speed off over the, the sign that's going to pop up. And I said, oh, I see. I said, uh huh. You know, uh, I said, J so you, you, you do this, this is your business, you're a stuntman. Oh, yeah. And I, and I said, oh, well, you like doing it? He said, oh, it's great, great pay. He said, the more broken bones I get, the more money I get. I yes, like, oh, that's good, you know, I guess. And, 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 and then I'm sitting there for a minute and I'm saying, well, wait a minute. So this is a dangerous stunt? He said, yeah. He said, oh, I said, well, do, do I have a stunt, man? He said, oh, yeah, you got a stunt, man. I, oh, that's great. Well, where is he? Oh, last time I saw him, he was having coffee with Adam West. And, and I hear him say, all right, roll it up. And I say, wait, whoa, whoa, there's a terrible mistake here. And the second unit director comes up and says, Bert, what, what's the problem? I said, well, this guy's a stuntman. He said, yeah, we know that. I know, but he's telling me this is a dangerous stunt. Yes, we know that. But but I don't understand. If you've got a stuntman for Adam because you don't want to take a chance of Adam getting hurt, why don't you have a stuntman for me so that I don't get hurt? Oh, we oh do have God. a stuntman for you. Oh, Okay. Well, why is not why is he not here? Oh, well, we can't use him. Well, <laughs> well, why can't you use him? He doesn't look like you. Well, you hired a stuntman to be my stuntman, <laughs> and you can't use him because he says that you do, that he doesn't look like me. Why would you hire him if he doesn't look like me? You couldn't find anybody else. Oh, all right. And it says plus you're going to be in a tight close up on your face when you come right up at the camera. So. He said, you got to do it, Bert. I said, okay, okay, all right, all right. So I'm saying to myself, all right, let's see here now. Coming out at 55 miles an hour, uh, let me put my seatbelt. There's no seatbelt. Oh, so, come on. Uh, and, and, and then, and well, let me hold on to the hand. No door handle on the inside. Oh, jeez. What, what am I going to hold on to? Oh, well, there is this one-eighth of an inch thick, flexible plastic windshield 
that's a mock-up windshield. And I'm going to hold on to this windshield coming out at 55 miles an hour and, and do it, skid the tires around and all that stuff. Oh, wow. my God. So I'm holding on, and the, and the, and the stunt man says, better hold on really tight. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, I got it. <clears throat> so I'm holding on for dear life. Come out, and he he did it perfectly. Everything he did was perfect, except unexpectedly, my door flew open. <laughs> I'm coming out at 55 miles an hour, and the centrifugal force was throwing me out the open door because it was my side that skid around. Okay, so the door flies open and knocks the camera man off the camera truck. He's oh on a big 35 millimeter uh, camera and knocks him over and knocks the camera over a big arc lamp that in those days they didn't have cool lights. They had these giant arc lamps, oh. you know, that, that, I mean, like, like a searchlight type thing. It's huge. Oh my God. It fell over. It could have killed somebody. If it went. Anyway, long story short, I'm thrown to the opening and I threw my arm, you know, just out of, I don't know, reaction threw my arm behind me. Somehow my little finger locked around the gear shift knob. And it kept me from falling out, but it pulled my finger out of joint, which wow. is incredibly painful if you've ever had that happen. Oh, my gosh. So, so anyway, now there's all this dust all over the place and the car stopped and the engine still rearing and you got the engine off and the people are rushing over. And they said, Bert, are you OK? I said, yes, except my hand is killing me. And I looked down and, you know, I'm wearing these gloves, but yeah. my finger had already swollen twice the size it's inside the glove. It's like oh, geez. the leather, oh, geez. the glove. And they said, oh, you, your fingers, are, we got to get you to the hospital. I said, okay. So they helped me out of the Batmobile. And I said, okay, well, um, which car, where do I go to, you know, for the car for the hospital? Oh, we can't go now. What? We can't go now. Why? Oh, we didn't get the shot. <laughs> oh, but, but, but it, Bert, there's a crew of 50 guys here. It's, you know, it, it's, it's like, I don't know, $30,000 every 10 minutes. We, we can't go. So now we got to get the shot. Oh now that God. was about 7, 15, 7, 30 in the morning. I ended up leaving for the hospital at noon. Oh, and, wow. And, and I had done the shot three times more. Oh, my gosh. Oh, so my God. They didn't get it the way they wanted exactly. So there I am at the hospital getting my finger reset. And the you know, doctors asked, well, how did this happen? Well, I tell them the story. He says, gee, it sounds pretty dangerous. That was day one. Day two. <laughs> day two now. I'm supposed to be in a burning car, a burning car on a car turned over. I'm in the burning car, but I'm not just in it. On Above me is Frank Gorshin, who is the Riddler. So oh, yeah. just imagine you're in a burning car and you're down underneath somebody oh, who's geez. above you Come who on. has to climb out of the car and jump down. And, oh, my and, gosh. and once he climbed out and jumped down, then I'm supposed to climb up through the driver's side. It's on its side and get on the edge and jump down. And, and, you know, you know, very claustrophobic, I got to be honest with you. And the heat, even though they had the, on the outside on flame and it wasn't flame inside, the heat is still tremendous, right? Oh, yeah. So anyway, uh, he, Frank Gorshin climbs up, jumps down. I climb up and I'm just getting ready to jump. And unexpectedly, the car blew up. Oh, my and gosh. All I remember was the ground coming right at my face. Just wow. instead of me going to the ground, it, whatever it looked like, that ground was coming oh, at wow. 200 miles an hour at my face. Oh, my gosh. And second degree burns in the back of my neck and the back of my I arms. And, and, and there I'm right back. And it's the same doctor. And he says, two days in a row. I said, yeah. <laughs> he said, you have bad luck? I said, no, I've never been in an emergency hospital in my life. I, I don't understand this. That was day two. Day oh, my four. gosh. How did you stay with it? I mean, there had to be part of you going, how, what am I going to do? I, I kept believing it, it can't happen again, right? What are the odds of it happening? The th well, third true. So, so now the third time I am, I'm tied down on a table in, a, in, a, in what's supposedly a subway where there's breakaway walls. Uh, and what's supposed to happen is Batman is supposed to, they use a, um, a, a small charge, super loud. It's a, uh, I, I forget, uh, magnesium, magnesium charge. I mean, it's thing is the loudest thing you've ever heard. And it, and it, and it gives an, an explosion, but it's not a big explosion, but it's enough that you think it's a real explosion. So they have this magnesium charge in this setup to be a, a, a subway that I'm supposedly in there and Batman's going to blow a hole through the wall and rescue me. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. in the infinite wisdom of the builders, they forgot to build a breakaway wall. 
Oh, come on. Now you have two by fours. I mean, you have a wall like in a house or in a, in a building, and it's not going to break away with a little charge. Oh, and there's no. no two to three weeks to, to rebuild it. There's no time to rebuild it. So what are the special effects guys do in their infinite wisdom? Two half sticks of dynamite. Oh, my God, dynamite. Right. And it blew, almost blew the entire soundstage down. Jeez. I'm down with my arms to my side, looking up, and I see a big two-by-four come down and hit me right oh. on the nose. Broke my nose. No. For the third time. Now the doctor's saying, you know, this is three days in a row. Maybe you consider another line of business. I said, I, I just, I couldn't believe it could happen again. And I, oh, and, come on. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, there's one more day. <laughs> next day is the famous shot from the first episode with, with Frank Gorshin, where we're outside this club. Uh, it's... Uh, it, it, it's a takeoff of, in Hollywood of the whiskey a go go. It's called What a Way to Go Go or something like that. Uh, you know, yeah. and and where um, I can't go into the club. Batman goes in. He gets drugged uh, by the by uh, Molly, the the villain's uh, girlfriend, Jill St. John. Anyway, so I'm I'm sitting outside in the Batmobile, and this is where um, the I get shot in the arm with a dart. And the, the studio told me that now this shot, because it's a whole block at 20th Century Fox, and, and they they said this is a quarter of a million dollar shot. This one shot. Oh my gosh. Again, there's too many effects in this. No matter what, Bert, no matter what, don't you move after you're knocked out by this dart. I don't care what you think. <laughs> don't you move. Oh boy, they really told me good, right? Wow. So sure enough, I get they shoot and they, this dart hits me. It, it stung, but it didn't really hurt that bad. But anyway, the point of it is I get knocked out. Well, the, with, in this case, the Riddler gets in the Batmobile and sees what he says is the start button. And it's really a cover for the, okay? I, I mean, it, 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 the Batman covers the alarm with the start button. So somebody getting in the Batmobile thinking they're starting the Batmobile are actually setting off the alarm. So when yeah. they set off the alarm, it shoots rockets, of, 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 just fireworks out of the three uh, pipes out of the back of the Batmobile that are shoot way up in the air. You know, I mean, shoots like these fireworks, you know, I don't know, 100 feet in the air, 200 feet. Oh, my feet. gosh. But the problem is not that. The problem is when they shoot them up, guess what? They come down. Okay. <laughs> And now they come down, burning right through my hair on, on my scalp, burning through uh, on my arm right into the bone. Oh, my gosh. Under shorts into the private areas, which really hurt. Okay. <laughs> and there I'm off to the hospital. Now, this is the fourth day in a row. This is crazy. Okay. And I honestly, I did not think I was going to survive the first episode. I really, and, but the, let me tell you, the studio was really smart. They were really smart. They took out this huge... And this is 1966, multi-million dollar life insurance policy on me, right? Like, oh, geez, I can see why. And I could swear by the end of the last season, they were trying to collect on that policy. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my I, gosh. There you are. And all those episodes, I, and, and the, you know, and I mean, all I, there's so many things. That, one, one other quick one. Yeah, uh, go ahead, know, please. I, I'm on top of a soundstage. If you've ever seen, well, I'm sure you have, a, a yeah. big, Downstage, I mean, it's like an like, air, 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 airplane hanger. Oh my, they're huge. I think they're bigger, taller. But anyway, so I'm up on top of the soundstage, and the scene is. And they say, now, Bert, right after lunch, you're doing this scene where you've got two of our best stuntmen. They're going to hold you over the uh, over the outside of the soundstage, okay? <laughs> and <laughs> they're two really strong guys, and they're going to hold you by the leg. So, you, you know, you're not going to fall. You have nothing to worry about. Oh, geez. My palms are sweating, literally, right now. Here I am choking my fried chicken down at lunch. And, I, now, and now it's come time for the scene. And I say, um, guys, uh, no matter what, I want a big, thick rope that I personally am going to tie around my ankle. And I'm going to personally tie it to one of these big poles here on top of the sound stage because I don't trust that those guys are gonna hold on to me. They said, Bert, these are two best guys. I said, yeah, they just finished eating fried chicken. What do you mean? <laughs> right. Their hands might be greasy and the, my, my leg might slip out from them and I'm gonna fall to my death 85 feet from the ground. Oh I, boy, I can't believe it. Of things that happen and, and the other last one, um, 
the bat poles. People say, oh, did you ever really slide down the, was the bat pole really high? Yeah, it, we did it one time where we had to climb up these rickety stairs. They keep going and you can see through these old wooden stairs, you're going up higher and higher. Inside. Oh, geez. Then you walk on this catwalk, this narrow catwalk that kind of gives as you're walking over it. <laughs> they had this set up and I'll, I don't know why I did it. It was the most stupid thing in my life and Adam did it too. They had the two poles with nothing down on the ground, 70 some odd feet below us. Nothing. Oh, no, no net. No nets. No nothing. Oh, we had wow. up onto the poles, and even the they had the stuntman guys were telling us, you're going to slide down. The friction is going to be so great, it burn right through your gloves. So what you do is you're sliding down. You, you tighten, and you if you're still moving, but it slows you down. You tighten, loosen, tighten, loosen, and then you take your shoes. And instead of holding like with your legs, you, you got to use the inside of your soles. They're going to burn them out just coming down that pole, you know, 70 feet. Anyway. Wow. You realize if we hadn't caught onto that pole properly, we'd both either bo both be dead. I mean, oh my God. I'm saying I would never do that again. <laughs> no. The pole is four feet from the, from where I have to jump. I mean, I had to jump out and grab this pole. Oh my gosh. This is crazy. Crazy. I mean, that gives you an idea. And then, Oh, every episode. And there was one, another time that, that I, you know how you can sense things sometimes that, you know, something could go really wrong. Yeah. Yeah. They're telling me this explosion to burn out of this prison cell that Mr. Freeze had it is that, that the explosion was going to go down and not come out. Okay. And I, and you know, it's one of those times in my life when I just sense something might go wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, plus all this time of everything else. <laughs> That's so, good. You, you well, kind of had a good reason. Yeah. There's some history. So, so just, I knew exactly what the cue was for the explosion to go off. And I, and I normally would never do this, but in this case, I closed my eyes, <gasps> closed my eyes shut, you know, I got the mask on, so they might not have noticed it because Adam and the, you know, it's a fairly wide shot, but I closed my eyes just before the explosion. The explosion came straight out, second degree burns on my eyelids. I would be blind today if I hadn't closed my eyes. I mean, that is absolutely crazy. But thank goodness you had that that sixth sense to do that. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm, I, I'm beginning to think as a sick S-I-C case. <laughs> I'm sick of getting hurt. But anyway, so, but yeah. other than that, and other than having the most uncomfortable costume you could imagine, that man was not built for tights and everything itched or burned or pinched or whatever. Other than those two things, I had a fantastic time. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Tell me this. So you, you obviously you mentioned Adam and, and, you know, Adam West being Batman is iconic. Um, what did you, uh, what was your first, the first time that you met? When, when did that happen? When was the that very was at first our screen time test met? at our screen test? And really, and, yeah, let, let me tell you a little background history. Um, I was, I had been studying professionally with a professional coach in Hollywood. I was going to UCLA and I was studying an acting class. Okay. But I had never tried out for a part, I, but I'd done a lot of study, you know? Okay. Well, I, my father was a very prominent real estate broker. And on the weekends, I would assist him by sitting on, like what they call it, sitting on a house where you wait and people come in, you hand them brochures. Well, yeah. in this one case, a famous producer came in. His name was Saul David. He did all the Von Ryan Express films. Oh, Cobra. I love those. Yeah, great, great, great producer. And I asked him if he'd watch a scene. And I just did a scene in front of him. He was so caught off guard. And he said, you know, that's pretty good. Let me send you to an agent. So he sent me to an agent. And the agent said, I can't get work for the actors I've got. Don't, you know, I would never take you. The only reason I'm doing this because this producer asked me to don't expect to work for a year. And if you get a job, you might have one single line. I said, wow. Okay. Wow. So, two weeks after that, I get a call from a secretary in his office and said, uh, there's something going on over at 20th Century Fox tomorrow. We have your name down, you know, go show up at 430. They'll give you a drive on pass and they'll show you where to go. And I said, okay, well, what's it about? Well, uh, we don't know. We've just seen a bunch of young guys. I said, okay. So you know, had no idea what it was. So I went there the next day and yep, I got my drive on and went to the uh, a bungalow. They have got the, all these bungalows. That's where they did their interviews and stuff like that in the production facilities. So 
uh, I went in and I met this casting director and uh, just asked me like a couple of questions and then said, would you like to meet the executive producer? I said, well, sure. I mean, doesn't everybody get to meet the executive? Oh my gosh. I this didn't know a crazy that. story. You have to understand, this was my first interview. I mean, so, this is crazy. Yeah, so they send me to another bungalow and I go over and uh, I, I was, and they said, oh, uh, Mr. Dozier will see you now. And I walked in and you gotta understand, I hadn't been rejected because I never tried out for anything. So I didn't go in as most actors do that are so emotionally damaged. You know, I mean, after being turned right. out, you know, if you're selling fuller brushes, I mean, and they don't like your brush, big deal. But when you're the product and somebody said, nah, no, I don't think you're good for this or whatever, it, you know, it hurts. Okay? Oh, it I, does. Yes. So I had never had that. So when I walked in to see him, I had no qualms. About, Hello, sir. Nice to meet you. And he's like, oh, my God, this guy <laughs> just comes in like a, like a Sherman tank, you know. Wow. And, and he looked at me for a minute. He says, you're kind of big for this part. I said, oh, well, sir, I promise you I won't grow anymore. And he, he laughed like, how could you promise somebody you're not going to grow? <laughs> right, right. And you're not that big, by the way. You weren't he asked me another this big guy. And he said, oh, I guess you've been playing parts between 15 and 17. Uh, yes, 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 yes. You know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I had on stage in, in the class. But not. Right. So he said, well, would you like to do a screen test? I said, sure. I mean, doesn't everybody get a screen? No, they don't. But I didn't know that. So oh, it was no. then that I went to a screen test, not knowing anything about it. I was handed a single sheet of paper that had paragraphs where it there was a name, Dick, and some dialogue, and then uh, um, uh, Bruce and dialogue, but no Bruce Wayne, no Dick Grayson, no Batman, no, not just. You, are, you have Dick. no idea. You have no idea. Uh, this is Batman. Uh, so they were going to. Had no idea. And, wow. and but the other things, I'd never even seen a Batman comic book where I grew up. They only had Superman and Superboy, not not Batman. So anyway, I they said, let me introduce you to the actor you're going to read with. So they introduced me to Adam. I sat down next to him. We started to run our lines. Within five minutes, the two of us were laughing. We got along so great. We like instant best friends. He has one of the most unusual senses of humor of anybody I'd ever met. One of the funniest, naturally funny people I'd ever met. And we laughed and we never stopped laughing for over 50 years. I mean, that's how much we got along. So we were, we really were good friends. We, you know, it was, and so uh, when we did the scene again, you know, there was no Batman stuff. This is Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson and, you know, whatever we're talking about. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I also did some martial arts. I was, it was a brown belt at the time. I've been studying karate, but then I, I, so after I did the martial arts stuff and then I did the, the this, this, um, you know, scene, uh, I said, thank you very much. And said, wait a minute, we're not done with you yet. I said, oh, okay, well, what do you want? They said, we want you to go over to the other side of, this, of the sound stage, and there uh, is a trailer with two wardrobe men in there and some clothes that we want, you know, they're going to help you get dressed. I said, well, <laughs> no disrespect, but I'm perfectly capable of dressing. <laughs> oh, no, 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 you don't understand. You just go over there. You'll understand when you get over there. So I walk and I walk and I walk. It's like three blocks on city blocks to get to the other side of this huge soundstage. And I go in and sure enough, they have this, like it's, I don't know, like a cushion, like a couch cushion with no back. This thing is like eight or nine feet long. It's huge. And there's clothes. There's all these things all over the place. And I said, am I going to put some of this on? They, one of the guys said, no, you're going to put all of it on. And I go, oh, they helped me get dressed. Most uncomfortable thing I'd ever, my entire life. John, you have no idea. When you have tights that pull the hair on your leg, you have a mask that, that rubs against the oh, eyelashes, oh. it irritates your eyelashes. Oh, I, yeah, you, I have, like that. you have a wool vest that the, the hairs of the wool are poking through your t-shirt. Oh. Yes. You have a cape that is double thick bridal satin to its extra smooth. And when you put it on your shoulders, the weight of that cape was at least 10 or 11 pounds. Wow. And it's pulling your neck back like this. You have to counteract by putting your head down to keep your head looking normal. Anyway, all, boots that don't fit, they're too tight. Oh everything, gosh. you couldn't find one thing that was good. All right, everything. Yes. So, and I'm in, and plus with the, with the mask, you can only see directly directly in front of you. You can't see any peripheral vision. You can't see down. I nearly broke my neck coming out, missing the step. 
oh uh, coming out gosh, of the trailer. Seriously. As I was leaving, being a positive person that I am, I said to these two wardrobe guys, I said, well, the good news here is that after another 15 or 20 minutes, I'll never have to wear this costume again. Oh my gosh, how funny. Last words, right? And then I saw Adam there and he's in this outfit. I, I had never seen Bat uh, Batman. So all I know is, I thought maybe this is some Shakespearean piece or something. Why wow. is he wearing the cape and the mask? And maybe he's, uh, what? I, I had no idea. So it wasn't until five or six weeks later when every week I was getting like maybe one or two calls from the studio saying, well, what's your shoe size? Well, seven and a half. What's your hat size? Well, I, I don't wear a hat. Well, go get your head measured. Well, <laughs> where do I go to get my head measured? I mean, you know, I'm just saying, I'm, 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 I'm 20 years old, you know, I'm right. saying, and I don't know all these things. And anyway, so the long and short of it is after five weeks, the agents call me and say, hey, you know, come on in, we're going to sign contracts. I said, wow, great. So now they're going to formally represent me instead of just saying that they would right, send. Me. Right, yeah. So I go in to see the agents and they put me in a little room and, and I look at this, I don't know, two inch contract. Oh my gosh. Said, gosh to be, that's pretty thick for an agency contract, I would imagine. So I, I look at down at it and it says 20th Century Fox on it. I said, oh no, no, no. Wow. And I said, I got up and I went to the door and said, excuse me, uh, miss, uh, I, I've got the wrong contracts here. I'm supposed to be signing my agency contracts. Oh, no, no, you got the right contracts. And I go back and I, and I said, well, wait a minute. This, this is for the studio. They said, yes, you got the part. I said, oh. I didn't know that. <laughs> the studio didn't tell you? No. And then two days later, they, I was called to the studio and I went there and the studio people said, you know, why are you so surprised? I said, well, nobody told me. You mean your agents didn't tell you you had the part? No. I mean, so seriously. For the last two weeks of the six weeks I was waiting, I had the part and didn't even know it. Oh, that's just absolutely crazy. That is one of the most amazing. I mean, I've done quite a few of these. That that may be the most amazing Hollywood story I have ever heard. Uh, well, I got one crazy. tail into that. One tail sure. into that. So, <clears throat> The executive producer, William Dozier, comes out while I'm there and says, uh, congratulations, Bert. I said, well, thank you, sir. And he said, you know, we interviewed 1,100 young actors for this role. It took Holy about a year and a half. Wow. 1,100. Would you like to know why we selected you? I said, yes, sir, I would, you know. And <clears throat> he said, the reason we picked you, Bert, is because forget television. What if there was a real Batman and Robin? I mean, for real. And so we think that who you are personally, Bert, is what we imagine Robin to be like. So we don't want you to try to take on any characters, anything like that. Here's exactly what we want you to do. Two things. We want you to be yourself and be enthusiastic. Well, asking me to be enthusiastic right. is like asking me to drink water, right? I mean, I have no, no problem with that. And to be myself. So throughout the years, when I would come back to do like a, a, did two feature films for Warner Brothers, I did The Voice and, and other, a whole bunch of animated stuff. Whenever I, Adam and I would do things together and I would go to work, they would say, oh, is it hard for you to get back in character? Well, no. I mean, <laughs> the character was me, right? I mean, yeah. how hard is it to be yourself? So anyway, there was just kind of a kind of thing, but, but, you know, I was really complimented. So all of the things that you saw on the show, all of the manners, those are things that I just came up with. And, and I was really honored because in 120 episodes, um, neither Adam or I, and with 32 different directors, not either of us were ever told how to say a single line in those three and a half years of filming. Wow. Not one time did they say, oh, can you say this more like this? Because Adam and I had a chemistry and, you know, he was... Oh, I loved Adam so much. He yeah. was so bigger than life. I mean, he thought of himself like, uh, like you know, Winston Churchill. I mean, yeah. <laughs> he, 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 you know, he said one time, he said, you know, Bert, there's the three Bs. I said, well, what are the three Bs? Bond, Beatles, and Batman. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and, and, and then one time he really, really, really got me. He came to me, he said, you know, Bert, I really now have fundamentally come to terms with playing the role of Batman. 
I said, oh, Adam, where are we going with this? <laughs> Last night, I watched the Ten Commandments. You know what I mean? And I watched, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. You know what I mean? <laughs> with, 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 you know, coming down with the word of God. You know Charlton what I mean? Heston. Yeah. Right. And, and when Charlton Heston said those lines, I fully understood what it was like to be Batman. I said, oh, my God. Adam. Oh, wow. Yes. Don't say that to anybody. Please don't say that. to anybody. You know, But it was so as grand and big as he saw himself and and talked very slow. You know, I mean, well, Robin, now, he let me did. Tell you, Why he was did not that? have a speech impediment. He had no problems, but he understood something that I didn't really think about at the time. He realized that this was a 30 minute show of which eight minutes were commercial and 22 minutes. And the slower he talked, the more on screen time he had. So, <laughs> so he would have these paragraphs that he <laughs> on and on. And I'm like, oh, like this. And I have one quick line like, you're right, Batman. <laughs> you know what he would do? He was so playful. I would say, you're right. And he, yes, Robin. <laughs> wouldn't let me have my two seconds without cutting in on my two seconds. Oh my God. And then, oh my gosh. The slot, and then he, all of a sudden he turned to the camera and walked right up. So all you could see is his mouth and they <laughs> cut, up, cut. Adam, this is a two shot. We want Bert in the scene. Well, I had to do it. You had to do this. Why did you have to? Oh, I was motivated. Oh, well, you get your motivation back on your marks and you oh. do this two shot with Bert. I mean, so in his playful way, he was always so mischievous and this and that. Wow. But the two of us, we had the best time on some weekends. We go out and play tennis together. I mean, we just really, and I tell you something, that unique chemistry we had, I think it really came across. People it did. Really, you, can't, you can't fake real chemistry you know no they've made look obviously they've made all the movies and there's there's been so many you know variations and everything like that and and i'm not saying that i i'm not a fan of those movies i i am i well different ones let's put it that way but when you talk about chemistry i agree with you there is no other batman and robin duo that has the chemistry that you had and also i gotta tell you bert when i think of robin I, it's true. It's like, I see you. I mean, I don't see, you know, Chris O'Donnell or whatever. I see Burt Ward. And I think that that's probably true for most Batman fans. You, I get what he was saying. Uh, Dozier was saying is you epitomize uh, who Robin is, you know, I, I, yeah, it's, 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 it's just crazy to me. Um, it, that's so interesting that you had that kind of chemistry. Let's, let's also talk about on another angle, you mentioned the martial arts earlier, and I happen to be a Bruce Lee fan. And I got to tell you, I was, I, I literally almost fell out of my chair when I, I was doing a little reading. And I'm like, oh my God, you didn't just like do something with Bruce Lee. You knew Bruce Lee. I oh mean, yeah. We, we lived in the same complex sure. and we used to spar together. That's where you fight, but you, you know, you pull your punches. You don't hit full contact. At the, at the complex? Like you would just do it at the <laughs> complex? I mean, you know, like on our balcony or his balcony or, you know, in the apartment or, you know, we find a place. He had his training studio too. But yeah. the point of it was we were personal friends. And um, uh, in fact, I remember when um, one time he and Linda, his wife, and Brandon, his son at the time, was six months old. Wow. Three of us went down into Chinatown and had a Chinese dinner together. And because Bruce had lived in Hong Kong for 10 years, he knew he ordered everything that wasn't on the menu. And we had just a, a fantastic time. But a piece of trivia for <clears throat> your viewers is that, of course, everybody knows he became the most famous cinematic martial artist probably that will ever be. Will ever be. Whatever. Yeah. And, uh, but a piece of trivia is that his first fight scene of his career that was filmed. The first film fight scene was fighting me on Batman. Really? Was, at, oh, Dozier, as Kato? As Kato. On, he was hired by William Dozier to play Kato on another series that the same executive producer was putting out called The Green Hornet. Okay. And it was going to... Now, Batman was a mid-season replacement. It came on January 12, 1966. 
But in the fall of 66, uh, the Green Hornet was premiering also on ABC. And here we were the number one show in the entire world at that time. I mean, it was just crazy. But what better way to introduce, you know, the Green Hornet and Cato than to have them in one of the episodes. Yeah, you know, yeah. Kicked off their, you know, fall premiere. So that was his first fight scene of the career. And, and the way they won everything on Batman, there was never any blood. Nobody ever really got hurt. I mean, somebody could pick up a chair and crack it over your head and you fall down, but then two seconds later, you're up again. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. <clears throat> and so they, and because both of us were good guys, I mean, both Batman and Robin being good guys and the Green Hornet and Cato being good guys, but supposedly neither of us knew that the other ones were good guys. So we were assumed that they were bad guys. Oh, they wow. thought that Batman and Robin were bad guys and we thought Cato and the Green Horn. So <clears throat> they, but they wanted everything to be even. You don't want to have it uneven. So, you know, they, they made it so it was very even and it wasn't real, but it was, you know, it was really, it, it, you know, real martial arts and stuff and, and that, that scene. And it was, uh, it was fun. It was, That's it was, wild. It was a really nice guy, really nice. A nice burn. I got to know him pretty well, you know, uh, over the years. Was um, so two things. Did did was it just by chance you just happened to like run into him in the hallway one day at your apartment complex, and that's how you became friends? I mean, how that how that happened? You know, uh, I don't I, I I don't know exactly how it was. We got talking about something. You know, I ran into him, and we were, we were talking about something. And you know, he really had. Let me tell you something. He had a wonderful sense of humor too. This was a guy that was really, <clears throat> he was sharp as a tack. I mean, I, I, he, he, he was different than Adam, but I mean, he, he was really, I mean, really sharp. And you know, I would go over to his apartment and he trained eight hours a day. Wow. He wow. never missed. He trained eight hours a day. I don't care if it's Christmas. He trained eight hours a day. Wow. And Anybody that has that kind of level of dedication, you know, and, and, you know, I, I learned quite a bit from him. Um, one of the things that he was very much on is refinement. You know, you see these people with these, all these big moves and stuff. And he kept, you know, he kept saying, you know, when you do something, you keep refining it and refining it so that you get the greatest amount of results with the least amount of effort. Wow. And, you know, everything was refining, 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 you know, and uh, it was, uh, you know, and we were friendly. And then I would see him at some of these tournaments, either he would give a demonstration or he'd be there, uh, you know, so it was, uh, you know, and then of course it was incredible tragedy that, you know, he died. Of course. And, uh, incredible tragedy. Adam died. I mean, it's just, gosh, so right. terribly unfortunate people that you care about, uh, you know, but, but it was an amazing time. And, and, you know, uh, yeah, when all I mean, this was before all his movies came out, you know, this oh, is definitely uh, I mean, he was still an amazing martial artist, you know, absolutely amazing. But it, at the level he is and, and, and even sparring, there is it's not like it becomes like one little mistake you make and, and the other one hits you. You know what I mean? In other words, right. there, there's like zero room for mistakes, you wow. know, that kind wow. of thing. Did anyway, you, that was a great experience. That's an amazing experience. Did you know at that time? By the way, you know I know that he had Kung Fu, the actual show that David Carradine uh, started. I understand that he was, you know, that was his idea. That was what he wanted to do. And then when they cast David, it, it really like was. Devastating. You know, I don't know anything about that, but okay. I do know that you know he was, you know, and he had his own style. He he had taken what he had learned, you know, as a student and modified it and he incorporated he, one of the things he did is he studied other styles he would get into the real fights with some of these experts in judo and aikido and jujitsu and and these other other karate and and i mean you know so many different things and yeah. he would pick the best things from them you know that he would use so he was really very very smart really wow. smart guy. now you had a lot of guest stars on the show by the way as well like Honestly, that's the other aspect of this. You come in, this is your first job as an actor. One, you're in a lead. It's it's an international show. And you're working with the most amazing talent, I think, of maybe any show I have ever looked at. I mean, 
everybody from Cesar Romero to George Raft, uh, Cliff Robertson was on there right before. I think he might have actually gotten the Academy Award for Charlie at that time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. These, these were big Oh, I people. mean, we had some of the old time, Tallulah Bankhead. I mean, yeah. if most people would not know who she was, but she was a famous, one of the top stars I don't know if it was the 20s or 30s or the oh, 40s. Yeah, no, but, totally, totally. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was amazing. And all of these actors and actresses that I worked with every week, it was a somebody that either I had seen in movie theaters or watched on television. How and, exciting. Uh, you know, I, I remember I had seen Vincent Price in a movie called The Raven as yeah. a child. It scared me to death. So I can't the, watch it now. <laughs> The day he came on the set, when I first saw him, I had that kind of a flutter in your stomach, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, wow. But he was such a nice guy. And uh, he, I mean, and all these actors, these were the ultimate pros. This is the old, what I considered old Hollywood. Every yeah. time they were always on time, they knew every line perfectly. They, they, they were just like perfect. I mean, they just were amazing to work with. And for me, I didn't have a favorite. I was like a kid in a candy store. Boy. Every one of these people I was in awe of. And to oh. be able to sit there, at, uh, you know, because the way it works on a set, it's not as glamorous as you might think that you sit there and you wait 45 minutes while they light a scene. And then, and then you work for 30 seconds. Then you sit for another 45 minutes. I mean, but during the times when we're waiting, um, like I would, take a seat next to Cesar Romero and talk to him. And, you know, wow, <clears throat> you just can't be, you, you, I just couldn't be more impressed with how their wow. level of professionalism was something that was just, I, I couldn't even believe. It was just awesome. Well, I'm so envious. I mean, I'm sorry to, to be able to like sit down next to, like you said, uh, Cesar Romero, uh, God, I'm trying to think. I, oh, uh, well, I mean, uh, Sam Cliff David Robertson. Jr. Uh, yeah. You know, Cliff Robertson, the great a actor, oh. too. Uh, you know, uh, Maurice Evans, Shakespearean actor. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, George, uh, well, not just George Raff. He was in the, the Lula Bankhead episode. He was playing always the bad guy, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, right, right. Uh, but George Saunders, uh, a yeah. great actor. Oh, so and, famous. You know, the, yeah. The, there's just so many, you know, uh, actors. Ghost and Mrs. Muir. He was in The Ghost of Mrs. Muir, actually, yeah. Right. And, and and every one of them, uh, you know, every one of them were were amazing to 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 work with. They, and they all had, you know, uh, uh, they all had their own style, but they all had that one consistent thing. They just exuded, and you know, and it wasn't false. They they were really stars. I mean, wow. they in your in their presence, you felt this was a real, true Hollywood star. Not just somebody that is a famous current actor or done a bunch of other movies and regardless how big a name they are today, those aren't, they, they'll never be, in my opinion, the, the true stars like they, they were. It, it was just, it, it was an awesome experience to be in their presence. What was it like working with Burgess Meredith, by the way? <clears throat> oh, he was a very funny guy. Really nice man. All of these people too. You, you'd think they might be aloof. Not... There's a, there's a saying in show business, the bigger they are, the nicer they are. Wow. Really nice. These are all, you know, I mean, and they all have their, I mean, they have their own formula of the way they approach work. And it's down to, I mean, a level of precision <laughs> that you just, you know, it's just awesome. It's just right. awesome. You know? And and yet you can, I mean, Frank Gorshin and I got to be very good friends. He played the Riddler. After yeah. the show, he came out to my house. And of course, he was scared of dogs. I don't know if your uh, viewers know that he was very. And we had we have some of the biggest dogs in the world at our house because we operate the world's largest giant breed dog rescue. Dogs Did he up come out when you had the big dogs? Oh yeah, I have a picture of him. Was sitting there between two of the giants. One of them uh, stood on his hind legs, seven feet five inches tall. Oh my gosh! You have an idea how big that dog was. When that dog stood on his hind legs, he was four inches taller than Shaquille O'Neal. And then 805 pounds. Okay, oh it, it is an avalanche. And Wait, he he's had on a, Frank's shoulders. Oh, he looked down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, just to give you an idea, on four legs, really, you're something your your viewers can really appreciate. 
give you an idea how big, this is like a size of a, of, 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 a, of a small horse. This dog was so big that when he was just on his all fours, he would come over to our kitchen sink and lean down to drink out of the faucet. Oh my gosh. And, oh my gosh. and his back, the level of his back, now on four legs. Now I'm not talking on his high leg. I'm talking on four legs on the ground. Oh my like gosh. If you and I got down on the ground, we'd only be about a foot and a half or two feet off the ground. Wow. But his back was 45 and a half inches from the ground, meaning so that you, your viewers can uh, and understand his back was four and a half, five and a half inches higher than their kitchen counter. Oh kitchen counter is 40 inches. And he's oh five, God. his back, the lowest part of his back was above the kitchen counter. I mean, that is unbelievable. Hey, I'd be, I, I would have been nervous myself. Come on. I'm no, not the no, biggest guy in the world. Let me you, you're not nervous around them. And I'll tell you why. Because the little dogs, the ones you have to be more careful of because they look up at a human being as being so much bigger and they're intimidated by him, in some cases frightened by him. But a dog the size of, and then I had another Great Dane, he's like seven, seven feet tall. And, and, you know, he weighed 285 pounds. And, 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 but the point of it is they're so big, they're not intimidated by you because they're bigger than you are. All right, you know? right. They're and, confident. And yeah. breed, the giant breeds, what makes them amazing is you take a, a, a working breed like a shepherd, they'll come over and play and play, but then they want to run off and play. The giant breeds, they think they're human. They come over and they just stay with you. They don't run <laughs> off. They stay here. How come he's not running and playing? And if you throw a ball with a Great Dane, he'll turn around and look at you and say, "Hey, you go chase." <laughs> I mean, they, they don't think they're they're dogs. They think they're human. Oh, that's really funny. Really funny. So, going back going back to Batman for a sec, um, you have your like catchphrases or whatever as Robin. Um, right. Did were any of those improvised or was that oh, all yeah. from the script? Yeah, well, no, the, the idea was that you try to follow the script, but in some cases with with a whole bunch of writers that we had, because, you know, it takes a while to write each episode, 120 yeah. episodes. That's a lot of, lot of writers. It Not is. all of them had the, what I would call the, the Batman style. They weren't perfectly, you know, aligned. I mean, I thought all did a great job, but some of them had more more of what our style was. So mm -hmm. they would allow me, you know, if I said, well, that just doesn't make any sense, you yeah. know, to change, especially those holy this or holy that line, because that always had to have some connection with something that, you know, we were doing, like we were in a spaghetti factory and had a line, holy ravioli, Batman. Right. I love that, by the and way. So it had to have something to do with what we were doing. And by the way, something for your viewers, Adam and I did something on Batman that in every major movie today, this particular style is used. And, and, and it originated with Adam and I doing this. And, it, it, and I'll, let me tell you what it is. Um, that right in the most critical scene, or action, whatever, the greatest danger, whatever, there will be dialogue between the two stars that is humorous. You know what I mean? Some yeah. quick breakaway, uh, like... You know, I, in Bad Boys, one of them could say, well, I, if we ever get out of this alive, I'm not coming over to your house again. I mean, it's a kind of a kind of a throwaway laugh thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We created that, by the way. There, this was never done before. We created, and, and one of the scenes that typifies this, when uh, I was in a warehouse with uh, Batman and Robin in a warehouse, and we're looking for the Joker, and all of a sudden, these, you know, uh, eight guys, big, huge guys, drop down and, you know, they're obviously ready for a fight. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we're caught by surprise, but I have a line where I turned to Batman. I said, gosh, Batman, there's eight of them against the two of us. Odds in our favor, you know, because there's only eight, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was that kind of satirical humor that is in, you look at every show made by Marvel, you look at every- Oh, deep, totally. And, you know, who is to say that they ever would have made any of these superhero movies if it hadn't been for the success of Batman? That's actually really true. You're right about that. Now, what about, I mean, on a, on a whole nother level on the set, one of the things that really kind of, it surprised me a little bit is how you and Adam, apparently it was like, 
there were women all over the place. Like you guys were like rock stars. Is is was that true? Yeah, it was. Well, we, you know, there was. It, it was. Uh, I don't know if there's some fantasy about superheroes, but yeah, we, you know, we, we, because every villain, you know, had a beautiful accomplice or whatever. Oh, and, totally. And, and then the personal appearances. I mean, I mean. We would Adam and I hold arena records at some of the biggest rock arenas, like for example, Cobo Hall in Detroit or McCulloch Place in Chicago. We actually hold the bigger than a rock group. We like uh, I think Cobo Hall in Detroit. We had a hundred eighty-eight thousand paid to see Adam and I over a weekend. Hundred eighty-eight thousand. What? Yeah, it was huge. It was it was it was just oh, I mean, it was just gigantic and. and uh, and so, we, yeah, there was everything was Batman. I mean, we, we came on and we were the number one and number two because we were on twice a week show in the entire world. Our, our wow. opening night had a 55 share, which, by the way, even Super Bowl doesn't get a 55 share, meaning that of all the televisions on in North America that night on January 12th, 1966, all of Canada, Mexico and the U.S., 55% of all the televisions were watching Batman and the other 45% were split among the other two networks, CBS and NBC, all the regional stations, local programming stations, you know what I mean? And wow. we had 55% it of the was, United States, literally with television. And, and, you know, 55% of North America watching wow. the opening. Oh my and gosh. Being the, biggest thing in the world it was it was it was really it was on a level of the beatles and and that's why adam said beatles bond and batman um it was it, i remember we made uh we came out with our batman movie and we went to new york we were supposed to go to 36 theaters in three days we had a big bus 17 police on the bus and an average of about 80 to 100 police at each theater in advance and they're locked arm in arm with stanchions wow. and everything. And yet the crowd just to see, just try to touch us and see us push them in constantly. I had my costume, my cape torn like three times in, in three days. And, wow. and in the we in fact, there was so dangerous to, to, to three of them, we couldn't even get off the bus because they police couldn't protect us. Oh my and, gosh. And, I mean, not trying to do harm to us, just, I mean, no. fans. I remember on Long Island, I went to a thing that, I mean, I, I'm telling you, it must have been a mile in both directions, the biggest parking lot, if you call it a parking lot in, in the whole United States, and where I couldn't even see the end of it, and where people shoulder to shoulder, they couldn't even get us up on the stage to talk to people. Oh, my it, gosh. It finally got us up there, but but it was like, you, as far as you could see, I mean, it would be like the equivalent of, 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 I don't know, eight or 10 blocks long in all directions. And there's just a sea of people. How do you even, you know, as a guy, especially, like I said, you, that was your first acting job. How do you even take that in mentally? Like it must've been weird to actually go on the road the first time and experience that. I mean. It was, but you know, the interesting thing is I wore a costume and what was so unbelievable on Batman. And I would constantly, you know, say something about it. I said, wait a minute, here's Commissioner Gordon's office. We're we're in there as Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson, and we leave, rush out, and five minutes later we come in as Batman and Robin. You're gonna tell me that they Commissioner Gordon can't figure out that that's the same people. <laughs> I know. And can I tell you something? I learned a lesson because when Adam and I would make appearances, you could have people that would stand in line for five and a half to six hours holding their children by the time they got up there to get the signature, the kids were already asleep and we felt horrible. You couldn't go any faster to sign these autographs. And and we could be there with people just going nuts and fighting over your paper cup or something, and yet go in and get changed and come out amongst the same people. And they wouldn't even know it was us, as oh, long as we weren't next to each other. If oh, we were next wow. to each other, they would. But if I could walk out, nobody knew it was me. No, but absolutely. So we had <clears throat> kind of a actual a luxury of not being recognized, you know. Although yeah, that if is. somebody said, "Well, oh, Adam West or Burt Ward are here," you know, you know, in this area. Well, then they'll look around. Yeah, but 
people are so involved with their kids, they're getting food, going to the bathroom, just with their own lives. People are so involved that they don't really notice things around them. God, that's crazy. Times. That's crazy. So on a whole nother level, um, and I do want to talk about Gentle Giants, and believe me, I, I, I'm going to give you a wide open forum on that because the, the viewers will love to hear about your passion for that. But I, I'm curious on a couple other things. I, I saw that you were involved with uh, pro wrestling, and I was like, where's the tie in there? I mean, it sounded like multiple times. Well, actually, it was just one event that I was, um, <clears throat> I, I made a personal appearance at a wrestling thing. Yeah. And uh, what happened is there was a guy that was, and one of the reasons why is that one of the wrestlers had a thing where they, he was called like something Batman, you know? I mean, he was like a wrestling Batman. Or oh, okay, I get it. What happened was, is that they wanted me to come out onto the wrestling thing. Um, and when they took a, a break in the wrestling to, uh, you know, knight this guy, as the as the the wrestling Batman or something, oh, you, I you know, you, I whatever you. it was, it was a promo thing. Well, you know, I don't know how it happened, but the guy started wrestling in front of me. The, no. the other guy came over and attacked the guy, and and you know, you know, you hear about wrestling being fake and stuff like that, but it didn't seem too terribly fake to me. <laughs> right, I know, I know what you mean. It's not yeah. supposed to happen while I'm doing this thing, and these guys knocked this guy. And he turns to me and he grabs to me. Now I'm a black belt in karate. So I just sweeped his arm and boom, hit him right, right. And he's like this, you know what I mean? And, oh my and God. Now, now the crowd really wants me to fight the guy, right? Of course. Right. So then he came at me again. I flipped him over on his back. And, and then the, the, by that time, the other Batman came in, or, you know, like double team. And then I let him wow. go. But I don't know why he did this. I mean, and what I did. <laughs> I hit him. It wasn't like any fake thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, exactly. When he went on his back, he went on his back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, when he came at me and I just, you know, I did a thing where I threw him a shoulder a flip and it fl and he landed really hard on his back. And, wow. and, and, you know, and there was, there's no cushions on that. I mean, that's not something people think, oh, they have probably full of cushions. No, right. that that's hard. That's a regular, you know, whatever. Oh, yeah. No, no, you hear it as it hits too. Um, oh, the, other, the other thing I, th I and I'm some of your some of my viewers may know some of them might might not but you also after Batman you appeared in like 40 films I mean pretty prolific right. uh yeah, I did a lot of TV these small TV films that um they were a lot of fun to do I mean I played characters from being a like a, a head of a, a, a you know a demon satanic group to playing the Pope in another movie so <laughs> wow. I mean it was a, and I, I had a lot of fun of doing it, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and people say, well, you know, I mean, is it hard on you? Were you upset that, you know, your major role was, was on that? And I said, no, think of it this way. If your cup is full, it could be full from a bunch of different films that you did or from one major thing and some, a bunch of smaller ones, it's still full. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I looked at it. And, you know, I mean, I've had ups and downs, too, when I was doing Batman. Oh, I'll tell you something. I had a kind of a little bit of a letdown where I was doing, and, and at 20th Century Fox, a young producer named Larry Terman, when this is right after the first um, season when I was on hiatus. Yeah. In fact, before the hiatus started, he came to me and said, I'm doing a really tiny little film here at Fox. Okay, this is not a big film. It's a tiny film, a really low budget, but I'd love for you to play the lead role. You know, and I said, oh, God, I'd love to do that. Yeah. And Fox, because it wasn't another studio, you know, Fox didn't complain about it. They thought, well, you know, I let them do it. But who complained about it was ABC Network. And ABC Network, you have to understand, when Batman came out, there really were only two broadcast networks, NBC and CBS. ABC was a syndicated network. It wasn't national. It really? Was I, didn't, I didn't know that. And what Batman in Bewitched did for ABC is made them the third broadcast network. Wow. So they, when they heard that I was going to do this small film, they got real upset about it. Said, we don't want to dilute anything that Burt Moore does. He, you can't let him do it. You know what I mean? And they really came down on Fox and Fox said, well, you know, I mean, that's the network. I, 
you don't want to lose the show. You're so you kidding. Can't do it. So, so I, I was, you know, a little bit dejected. Um, you might have heard of the movie. It uh, was called The Graduate. It oh, came out with on. Dustin Hoffman when they couldn't no. get they hired Dustin Hoffman. And that's the movie that, and, and for years, every four or five years, I would see Larry Terman maybe out at some restaurant or somebody say, Bert, I always wanted you for that part. I said, oh, don't, don't rub it in, Larry. Please don't rub it in. I couldn't do it. I wanted to. Oh my gosh, that's that's quite a story. I'm telling you, Bert, you have been around like everything and things just kind of, you know, work work towards you or whatever. Um, one last one in regards to Adam, because uh, you stayed friends so long. Uh, were you aware when he was going to pass? Like, was he, you know, health-wise or anything like that? Or was it a complete shock to you when that happened? It was a complete shock. Mm -hmm. uh, three weeks before... He and I made an appearance here in Los Angeles uh, at the airport at a big hotel thing where they had a memorabilia show and thousands of people were there. And uh, I, I had no idea. Uh, and, and, and I was, I don't, it, and it bothers me because it's, I'm still unsettled about what actually happened. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe he was ill. I don't think he thought for one minute something was going to happen. Wow. Uh, what I had heard was the only thing I heard later on was that in flying to these appearances, he was having a little hard time catching his breath. And he went in up at Salt Lake city in that area where he lived to a local hospital. And they said, well, you, you know, they got better equipment, go to UCLA. And I didn't even know he came to UCLA. And I understood that he, uh, was, uh, they said that he had had a little bit of leukemia, but not life threatening. Just oh, really? and they said it could be managed, and that you know he could certainly continue living a normal life with medication. You oh know what I mean? Gosh. Nothing life threatening. But Adam had always told me that he never wanted to live to a point where he became a crippled in any yeah. way. Yeah. You see what I mean? He I never saw. That. I'm such an active skier and stuff like that. And, and I, I don't think he died of, of an illness. I, I, I don't know exactly if he chose to, but I know one thing, if I had known that he was in the hospital or where it was, believe me, I would have gotten in touch with him. And if it was something to do with whatever, I would have talked him out of it. Oh, wow. That's yeah, something uh, else. But, but I, I don't know. And I only heard after it happened and, and it just like floored me because mm. we really had love for each other. I mean, I mean, we, I had the greatest respect. We had, it's 50 year, 55 years of working together. That's a long time. You no. Know, and we, we got along so well and we had so many inside jokes and, and we'd make these appearances at these memorabilia shows. And I mean, he would do things like, you know, we, they, we have a, the, what they call a panel where you get like, I mean, anywhere from a minimum of 500 people, I've had it up to seven or 8,000 in wow. a giant area uh, where, you know, you speak and they, people ask questions and you, you have kind of your own thing that you talk about your yeah. experience. And uh, I would usually be introduced first. I come out and say hello to people and they clap and everything. And then I'd introduce Adam and Adam, we never discussed ahead of time what we would say about each other or to <laughs> each other. But then it would be truly unpredictable. And we teased each other unmercifully. I, oh my gosh. Sweetest of ways. Because I love the man. Okay. Sweetest of ways. But I remember he would come out and he's such a naturally funny guy. He would come out to the front of the stage. He says, and they'd be cheering. Oh, you know. He says, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to stand here for a few moments and let you admire my incredible physical development. <laughs> laughing and laughing see would you and, and he was 88 at the time and he's and, and, and uh i mean at that particular time and he 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 said uh he said would you like to know how i keep in such great condition every morning i have a bowl of burt ward's gentle giants dog and puppy food <laughs> and that keeps me up and and, and you know the ears because he had a way that his delivery he just made people laugh <laughs> made me laugh he just we just we just loved each other, you know, and, and people could tell because there would be times where we asked questions 
and I would answer in a way that the audience knew. They didn't know what, what I really meant by it, but they knew that Adam knew that I was, you know, jabbing him in the oh, friendliest funny. way about something maybe that was embarrassing that had happened to him. I mean, we play all these practical jokes on, on each other. I mean, I gave him a 50th birthday party when he was like 40, you know, at a hotel <laughs> with my parents, and I had him make a 50th birthday cake. And, and, and I knew that Adam liked to, he liked to drink, you know, not, not excessively, but he liked to drink. Yeah. And so I knew that on a, when we come in on a Friday night to make these appearances Saturday and Sunday, that he wouldn't want to sleep in Saturday morning before the appearance. So I made a big deal at this hotel. I got all of the, 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 the bus boys and the waiters and the, the room cleaners to be at his room at 7 a.m. on Saturday <laughs> morning. And they said, no, I'm sure Mr. Mr. West wants to sleep. Oh, no, he gets up very early. And if you don't get there to sing happy birthday and bring him a birthday, you're going to miss out on his birthday. He's going to be terribly disappointed. So I got all these people, I, as I understand, it was oh, over 100, because this is a really big hotel. Oh. Over 100 people were at his door at 7 a.m. <laughs> and, he, he, and, and it was about 7.20, 7.30 maybe. He called me, Bert, Bert, what have you done to me? What, Adam, what, what? He said, oh, 7 o'clock in the morning, somebody knocking at the door and this big German lady with a guttural English is saying that she has to come in and wish me happy birthday. <laughs> he wouldn't leave me alone. I finally got up. He says, I opened the door. I think my breath knocked the first five or six over. And he would not, they came into my room and made me listen to happy birthday. And I, I looked out and it says 50 birthday. I'm 40 years old. Why would you give me a 50th birthday? And it was that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, oh. he would do things like, I'd come back and we were going to make an appearance. He had my boots that I had where I was going to get dressed. He put them in the freezer. Oh, my God. Talk about getting cold feet. <laughs> I put itching powder in his tights. And you should see him like this. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we loved each other, but we played practical jokes. We, just, we had a great time. We had a great time. Oh, oh. my God. Oh, Bert, you're killing me. You are killing me. Um, okay, so... I, I do this with every one of my guests. Uh, I, I like to leave it as like an open forum about what they are involved in, what they are passionate about. And for you, I I, I, I don't think I'm overstepping bounds here to say gentle giants is a, is a, you know, a right. big part of your life. Can you tell them uh, the fans about it and all of that? Well, 28 years ago, my wife and I uh, moved to this wonderful, it's like a little Western town halfway between Los Angeles and Palm Springs. And we had a three-year-old daughter and we decided to get her a dog. And I had always liked Great Danes and my wife always liked Irish Wolfhounds. So in the process for looking for a giant breed dog for our daughter to grow up with, because, you know, kids like dogs to grow up with. Yeah. We, we found, uh, I found out that the Great Danes in Southern California, when people couldn't give them, they would go to a shelter and they'd be put to death. They were all being put to death. Nobody was adopting them because in animal shelters, it's a lot of barking. The dogs are frightened and stuff. And mm -hmm. you see a big Great Dane in a cage that's barking. And who's going to want to take that dog out, right? Oh, how sad. And then if they're not adopted in four or five days, they're put to sleep. I mean, it, and mm -hmm. anyway, we found out about this and we said, wait a minute, this is a terrible injustice. And what it was, was the person who, because there's rescues for every breed of dog. Oh, but certainly. For Southern California at the time, there was one lady that was like the Southern California, California rescuer for Great Danes, and she herself had passed away. So oh all these dogs goodness. are being put to death. And it was in oh. August of 1994, we moved here May of 94, that I said to my wife, Tracy, I said, we can't let these big, beautiful, gentle dogs die. You know, how about we just take them right now? You know, whatever we hear about them, let's just take them in a couple of weeks. I'm sure we'll find somebody to take over this rescue. You know what I mean? Oh, that we, takes we, guts. Well, it's been 28 years. Nobody wow. has taken over the rescue. And I'm waiting for somebody to come rescue me. But, <laughs> but, so by the end of the first month, I had 102 full-size Great Danes, giant dogs, in my house. Oh, come on. Because they're house dogs. Come on. How do, Absolutely. How do you, and wait a minute. 100. And 102 
and 62 puppies under seven weeks of age. Wow. None of these came from the dogs, the Great Danes we rescued, but we rescued them from shelters where shelter would say, well, we just, you know, these people couldn't handle it. We took in this litter of Great Danes and it's not safe in the shelter because there could be rampant disease. You know, there's so many animals coming in and going out. So can you take these? And so my wife, Tracy, was sleeping on our kitchen floor, getting these litters where you have to attach them to the mother so they could nurse. And because Great Danes are so big, when the mother is finished nursing and she stands up, you got to make sure she doesn't step on one because she could kill it accidentally. Oh so she's like, oh my gosh. And, and then she put the mother out to be able to go to the bathroom and eat. And she, we would incubate in a warm area, the puppies, and bring the next litter in. That's and crazy. And by the time she got finished with seven litters, it was time to start the first litter again. Wow. Because they had to nurse all day long. And this, she went on for two months like this, and she literally had her pillow sleeping on the kitchen floor with a blanket where the puppies and the mothers Oh, my were. gosh. Oh, my. Yes. Well, she was wiped out. She was really wiped out from that. But <clears throat> we started saving these dogs. One of the things we found out is that these giant dogs traditionally have very short lifespans. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you've heard of English Mastiffs and, and Irish Wolfhounds. Yeah. Their yeah. traditional lifespan is only six to eight years. Oh, my gosh. That's Three, very eight, short for a dog. Seven to nine years. Yeah. Right? And the giant breeds rarely does you ever have one that lives more than nine years. And oh, you're I talking about, that. oh, I mean, there must be, well, I mean, there's, 35 breeds of mastiffs uh, there's there's there, there's all these breeds and they live such short lifetimes and and what we did is we would adopt them so that we could you know take more in i mean and we learned the whole thing what does it take and and we found out that first we're giving them away and we found out the first vet bill they had people don't appreciate things if you give them for free if the first vet bill they'd come back and say here's the dog back wow. well, why is that oh i got a 50 dollars vet bill we gave you the dog. These dogs are worth thousands of dollars. We gave right. it to you for free, thinking you'd take care of it. Oh, I don't want to be bothered with a vet. Oh, my God. So, oh, and all of a sudden, so, mm, we're going to be a lot more careful. And so we charged several hundred dollars, which is nothing compared to the thousands that they really sell for. If you right. go to buy. But in any event, we, we, we rescued these dogs. We found homes for them. But the ones we didn't rescue, if we lost one, it would devastate Tracy. I mean, we literally sob and cry. Oh God. So oh God. We vowed, it didn't take very long. I said, we vowed that if there was a way to help these dogs live longer, that we would try to find a way to do that. And we first came up with a feeding and care program. We feed and care for dogs differently than other people do. And it's a very traditional thing. People, oh, you feed the dog twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, and all of this stuff. No. We have a completely different way of feeding and caring for dogs that adds a minimum of three to five years to their life. Three just to five. By the, three to five years just by the way you feed them and care for them. That's number one. Then, wow. and so we got our Great Danes that were living only seven to nine years, actually up to 12 years of age. And, you know, which is at the time was like considered amazing. That, that is amazing. It, I can consider right. that now. That's still amazing. Well, but now, then we, we decided, you know, what else could we do to help these? Because you have to understand, the bigger they are, the more gentle they are because they're not intimidated by a human being because they're bigger than a human being. That's wild. So that's why they call them gentle giants. And mm -hmm. these are house dogs. Most people are saying, oh, you mean you keep that dog in your house? Yeah. And most people don't know that a Great Dane is the number one apartment dog in new york city oh the my number God. one apartment a great dane they, wow. they, they don't have a double coat of fur like like you know shepherds or other breeds that have that double coat that yeah. inner coat that's always shedding great danes and and giant breeds have a single coat they only shed twice a year and the rest of the time they don't shed wow that's amazing and, and, and uh, but, but because they have that single coat there is like us being in a bathing suit they can't take the cold outside and mm -hmm. it's cold. They can't take the heat to be indirect. And plus they get skin cancer, all these things that we learned. But we decided that what if we made the finest food in the world that we could make for our dogs? You know, we didn't think about ever selling it for our dogs. And so we made this food and we spent several years to develop it. We got the best nutritionist. We did everything. And, and for two people, 
unlike the government that you hear about, they spend three hundred dollars on an airplane toilet seat. Exactly. We, spent, we watched our money and we spent four million dollars to develop what we believe it is, and I know now know is the finest food in the world. Wow. And what our dogs, by the way, we fed them, and the food we fed them started living longer and longer. Our Great Danes have lived the oldest great dane we've had is 22 years of age 22 okay. and the oldest giant breed dog we've had is 27 and a half years our cats seven and a half that's we, unheard of in a dog we, we also rescue cats not as many we rescued fifteen thousand five hundred dogs more than fifteen thousand five hundred that was our count about four years ago we stopped counting and wow. every one of those fifteen thousand five hundred has lived in our house. That's lived incredible. House. Not some building, not some yard, in our house as a member of our family. And everyone is in our feeding and care program. And everyone eats our food that we, we feed 600 pounds a day. So I when mean, you look at a big 30 pound bag of dog food, we feed 20 bags a day. And you can only imagine what does it take to lift, carry, pour, and clean up from 20 bags a day. I can't imagine, years. by the way. I cannot. I cannot imagine that. How yeah. the hell do you do that? That's incredible. Oh, well, you got to have help. Now, what's interesting is because, you know, we get people, we get about 1,100 people a week that call us. And because we really have become, honestly, the ultimate experts in caring for dogs. And the reason I say that is because I don't know anyone else in the world that has dogs living as long or as healthy, we have no yep. illness. I mean, just think about it. I don't know if you have a pet. I, I grew up with a bulldog for 10 years. So, I mean, I know that issues. We have no medical issues. Our dogs, the only time they ever go to a veterinarian is every three years for a $10 or $15 rabies update. Wow. That's all. They're so wow. healthy because of the food and because of the way we care for them. So long story short, we were adopting these dogs and when people would come to adopt a beautiful great day or I mean, we have 45 different breeds here john there's only 134 breeds of dogs wow. we have 45 it's almost a wow. third of all the breeds here we That's have little dogs as well we're known for the giants we have we have dogs that that are one third the size of a chihuahua wow. that are called chinese crestwoods the average chihuahua weighs five and a half pounds we have these chinese crestwoods a small version that as an adult weigh two pounds. Oh my two God. Two pounds as oh an adult. Gosh. They're like they're this big, they're little. Okay. Wow. And they all live with the giants and everybody gets along and the giants avoid stepping on. I mean, it, it's a very, it's very, it's like nutritional. It's a, it's an environment that is just, you know, it just emotionally great anyway. But the long and short of it is we wow. would adopt dogs and people would come and see like even when we first got our food, we, we got the, the, these Great Danes. I had a Great Dane here at 16 years old. And and people could ask their vet, oh, I went and saw a 16-year-old Great Dane. And, oh, vet said, no way, that's impossible. You couldn't do that. But they would see them when they're here. And so when they would adopt the dog, they would say, you know, and they see a Great Dane that's 16 years old. And they say, I can't believe that dog. I mean, you can tell he's really old, but he's running around just like a regular dog. You know, I can't believe it. So they said, what do you feed him? Oh, well, we have a special food that we make just for our dogs, you know? Yeah. And they say, well, I want that food. Well, no, we just made it, you know, for our rescue. You yeah. can go out and feed whatever you want. No, 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 no. I see a 16 year old Great Dane. I want the food that that dog eats for my dog. Oh, oh my well, gosh. Geez, uh, these are plain white bags. We legally can't sell them to you to, to comply with labeling laws. So we scrambled and within a month, we had found out all the stuff we had to do to comply with labeling laws. And first in California, now we've been cleared for many years in all states, but you have, to, you know, very rigorous, you know, um, yeah. label yeah. laws, They're testing some of the states test our food. But the bottom line from this is that we had to start selling our food because the people wouldn't adopt the dog if, the, if we wouldn't let them have the food because oh my otherwise God. my dog's only going to live a couple of years when, yeah. when my yeah. dog can live into his 20s. When did you start officially selling it? Uh, 2005. What wow. is that? That's wow. 17 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, but 
we, because we don't take any money from this, I mean, we're not making any profit. We don't take one dime in salary. So it, it, there wasn't any, and we, for whatever it cost us to make it, we sold it for that price. People That's amazing. All the time. Oh, I know what you do. You might not personally take any money, but you take all the profits you put in your rescue. I said, no, no, you don't understand. Be, because it costs us so much to make this food. If it costs me $30 to make a bag, I'll sell it to the store for $30. I'm wow. only, we're only trying to get our money out, uh, you know, so that we can keep afford to keep making it. And what makes our food, our food costs us more to make than a lot of foods retail for. And wow. here's the reason why. And here's why dogs are living so much longer on our food. Because people say, well, what is it? What is there some kind of magic? No, it's all science. We do two things that separate us from every other pet food manufacturer on the planet, in my opinion. And here's what we do, and here's why our dogs can live into their late 20s. Mm -hmm. Number one, <clears throat> anybody that has a dog, I tell them, if you want to know the difference between our food and your food, go pick up three or four kibbles of that food. Rub them in your fingers. Put, the, put them down. Rub your fingers together. You're going to feel that slightly greasy feeling mm -hmm. because all dog food is coated, except ours, with a heavy coating of animal fat. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, why would they do that? Well, it does make them eat more, yes, because it actually affects the dog's brain to believe mm -hmm. they're always hungry. I mean, just think, what a cruel thing to feed an animal a food that you know is going to confuse their brain to believe they're always hungry. Mm -hmm. And if they're always hungry, they eat more food. And if they eat more food, they have to buy more food, don't they? Right. Okay. Now, people say, well, how could that really work? And I said, let me give you a human example. And you know, if you think about it, John, about 10 or 11 years ago, there was a guy named Morgan Spurlock that went into a McDonald's in Ohio. Uh, yep. He ate every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a snack in that McDonald's. Supersized me. That's right. They made a movie about him. He gained 55 pounds and almost died. Why? Yep. High fat content in the food. We don't do that. <clears throat> so not only do the manufacturers coat the food with a heavy animal fat, grease, mm -hmm. They fill the inside with it as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so our food is about half the fat content because we we leave it whatever's natural in the food. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. we don't, we're not adding fat to try to sell more dog food. So uh, the average dog food has anywhere from 12 to 22% crude fat. That's what they make you put on the bag because wow. it's saturated fat. It's not the good, the bad fats. Whereas ours is 9%. So... And, and think of it this way. People say, well, still, how can that affect a dog's life so much? And I'll say, well, think of it this way. Would you ever take a can of bacon grease and pour it down your garbage disposal? Oh, of course not. Well, why wouldn't you do that? Oh, well, clog it up. And absolutely, not only would it clog it up, but if you left it overnight, mm -hmm. you find that, that that animal fat coagulates, not, not, <laughs> not like evaporate like water, but coagulates. And when it hardens, it's like cement. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if you did this, you'd be calling a plumber the next day to replace your garbage disposal and perhaps dig out the pipes in your sink. So when you realize that animal fat will ruin a metal garbage disposal, <clears throat> what do you think is happening to the arteries and intestines of dogs when every single day, every single meal, every single bite, every single animal fat? is encapsulated in animal fat. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, oh, I didn't realize that, Bert. Well, why do you think our dogs are living so long? It's not that we've discovered the fountain of youth. We haven't. Believe me, if I had discovered it, I'd be drinking from it. Sure. It's, we're not prematurely killing animals. They can live so much longer if you don't clog their arteries and you don't clog their intestines. That's number one. <clears throat> number two. GMOs are in our food supply, genetically modified organisms. You know, a farmer gr uh, goes to grow a plant like rice, and he's growing the plant, and pests will attack the plant. If he sprays pesticides, it will kill the pest, but half the time it'll kill the plant, right? Mm -hmm. So here comes along these big companies, and they develop glyphosate, which is in Roundup, which you've heard about all those cancer. Oh, God, yeah, I know exactly, yeah. That same glyphosate is mixed into the DNA, has oh. been in the DNA of plants, 
So what happens is when a farmer grows the rice or other what a vegetable or fruit and he sprays for the pesticide with a pesticide, it doesn't kill the plant and the rice or the vegetables, the fruit is all produced and sold into the marketplace. But that vegetable or fruit has absorbed that, okay, poisonous. Yeah, that's plant, gross. You know, and, 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 and that pesticide is now consumed by an animal that has a much more frail immune system than a human being. And yet you hear about human beings coming down with cancer if they've been too close to a field where they used this, you know, Roundup and stuff like that. I right. mean, billions of dollars are set aside in judgments because of human beings. Well, think about an animal who's not near as developed as a human being. It's wiping them out. In fact, on our website, <clears throat> I invite your visitors to go to gentlegiantsdogfood.com and gentlegiantscatfood.com as well. And they can, there's a section, we have a menu at the top of every page. One of the sections is non-GMO ingredients. Hmm. <clears throat> if they go to that section, they will see an eight minute video. That's all I want them to watch, eight minutes. We did not make it. We got it from a research site that all they do is research for humans and yeah. animals, what the effects of GMOs are. That's all they do. And we, but the reason why we put this video on our website is because everyone interviewed in the video, John, is a veterinarian. Oh, wow. Here's what almost every single vet says the same thing, which is 10, 15, 20 years ago, they would see one patient, dog or cat, a month that had cancer. Now, today, every single day, one wow. out of every two patients they see has cancer. Oh, is that scary? It is over 50% of the population of dogs in the U.S. has cancer. Oh, my God. 50%. And it's getting worse. Oh. And we attributed that to the GMOs in the food supply. Well, if you want to keep dogs living longer, you better not give them cancer, right? So yeah. in the U.S., here's the challenge. 98% of our food supply is genetically modified. Only 2% yeah. is non-GMO. We spent a year and a half to find non-GMO suppliers that could certify in writing that they are non-GMO, no, no pesticide, ever been on that, okay? And all of our pet food, both dog food and cat food, is 100% non-GMO. Wow. So when you wow. say, how can a dog live to 27 and a half years? Did, and by the way, when she died, she died in her sleep. You know, she just went to sleep and, you know, if that's the way you're going to go, that's got to probably that's be one of the best you can do. Yeah. Illness or some injury. But just to give you an idea, the television show Inside Edition came out to our house. Wow. When our dog Tara was 25 years old. They spent the whole day videotaping her. We have all the medical records for all our dogs because we're a rescue. We have to have all those records. So we obviously can prove it. But they filmed her at 25, jumping up and down wrestling with her best friend where they jump up and play with each other oh and my God. wrestle with each other. At 25, she lived to 27 and a half. And she's a giant breed. People oh say, oh, you God. mean that would must have been a little tiny? Oh, no. This is a giant breed dog that normally wow. only lives seven to nine years. She lived four times, quadruple her normal lifespan. I mean, that's now, crazy. That's crazy. It is. And, but, but here's what we have consistently. Consistently. We have almost every breed of dog we have here. I think maybe everyone we have currently has already doubled their lifespan. Everyone yeah, that says a lot. Not, not four a times, lot. not three times, but double. So yeah. um, we have English Mastiffs here. I have a big, beautiful one. I have a bunch of them. I've got Irish Wolfhounds. I've got every kind of breed you can imagine here. Wow. The youngest dog we have here. Now, these are all breeds that live maximum anywhere six to eight or seven to nine years. The youngest dog I have here right now is 14 and a half years old. Oh my God. And the oldest dog I have here is 26 years old. Okay, that's right amazing. Now, that's mean, the terrific. range. Now, our food, it's called Gentle Giants. It's available all across the country. You can go to Target stores. You can, if it, we just started in, uh, in Texas in HEB, one of the big, big Texas chain HEB mm -hmm. stores. Now have Gentle Giants dog food and cat food. Um, Southern California, Stater Brothers, Ralph's, uh, Gelson's. And, I mean, we're all across the country, you know, in, in stores, um, you know, uh, 
food city back east in Virginia, Tennessee, you know, uh, Alabama, uh, and Georgia. But the point of it is we're, we now have it available and it's available online and we take nothing from it. And our dog food currently actually retails for half of what the really expensive dog foods are. Wow. Okay. That's, we're that's about insane. the same price as the cheap ones, but we're full. Oh, I mean, like not night and day, there's no comparison. And I wow. couldn't imagine anybody that loves their dog would not want to feed a food that can give your dogs double or triple their, or maybe more their lifespan. Same yeah, with their- I, I, I would have to agree with you on that. Yeah. If I still have my dog, believe me, I'd be feeding them gentle giants. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing with our cats, we, how we started making cat food now, 15,500 dogs rescued, you know, 28 years, but somewhere between, I don't, can't get the count exactly, somewhere between three to 400 cats in those 28 years, okay? Mm-hmm. Still yeah. a lot of cats, right? It's still a lot, <laughs> yeah, it's still a lot of cats. Okay, but not like our, our dog rescue. We lost two cats two years ago. One was 31 years old and the other was 32 years oh old. Oh my gosh. You know what they were eating? They were eating our dog food. Wow. And now we had regular cat food there, but they were eating our dog. They didn't want the cat food. They wanted our dog food in, in pulling both the dry and the wet. But here's what's interesting. What we did is we went back to the same nutrition and said, this is unbelievable. These cats are doing so well. But we know cats need a little extra nutrition, a little maybe this, that. Take our dog food, basic as it is, redesign it to maximize it for cats, which we've now done. And we have people, testimonials, we have one vet that had operated on his cat eight times. He had to operate on it for various things and has access to every prescription food. He only feeds gentle giants. Wow. You know, and people say, well, you know, I mean, what about working dogs? You know, and, you know, like, you know, the dogs that are really, you know, the, the police dogs or, you know, milk, mm-hmm. you know, um, there, in my opinion, there's no harder working dog than a breed that pulls a sled in a hundred below zero across Alaska. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I you agree. Find one that works harder. I agree. And we have one of our, one of our customers has, you know, his sled dogs. And, wow. and he said, once he switched to gentle giants, the retired ones that, okay, were in their teens were now barking and wanting to pull the sled again. And oh he my pull God. the sled that they had retired him, but now they wanted back in because they, they, there's a camaraderie among the- Wow, you know, wow. So anyway, that's, yeah. that's, it's become our charity and- I understand. And, and it's something we don't take any money from. And we end up, to be honest with you, 1,100 people a week are contacting us, John, through wow. Facebook messages, emails, phone calls, and they call for everything. Well, what do I do about this? Or how do I feed my dog? Or how do I do that? You know, and we, you know, invite them to go to our website, but we end up explaining everything to them and we help people and they're so thankful. We, on Facebook, we literally, you could spend at least two months going down these letters from people, <coughs> thousands wow. of them, where their dog's lives were changed. Wow. And most people say that after a month on our food, fully on our food, when they've gotten off with all the fat gone, yeah, yeah, other, yeah. once they're about five or six weeks in our food, that they almost don't recognize their dog. And wow. here's the reason why. That grease that accumulates in dogs, and these are what our expert vets tell us, it's an amazing how an, an animal's body actually will reject that fat from their system. Okay, mm-hmm. but it takes about a month to come out. Now, the difference between our food and all the other pet foods, they're putting the fat right back in. So the dog really never sees any benefit. Right. But after five or six weeks of being on Gentle Giants where you don't have that high fat content, okay, their systems now have gotten rid of the grease, gotten rid of the fat. And dogs that, I mean, I have people, one lady said, my dog hasn't jumped up on my bed, my little dog in three years. And now after five weeks, she's jumping up on my bed again. Thank you for giving me my puppy back. That's yeah, what we cool. Thank you for giving, and dogs that didn't want to play are playing again because yeah. their arteries are opened up. <clears throat> their intestines, the nutrients can flow and nourish their body properly. Wow. Just, just exceptional, Bert. I mean, really, it's very, it's just very moving and it's just very inspirational. And that's, that's, that's just great. I love, I love the, the, the honesty and the truthfulness and the, just the, 
sincerity that you have, you know, you and your wife. I mean, obviously, I, there's nothing without your wife here as well. Oh, there's, let me tell you something. You know what she's doing 15 to 18 hours a day? She's taking care of 50 dogs. Oh, now, I'll, I'll, <laughs> let me tell you, by herself, by I herself. Okay, so yeah. I have people say to me, oh, I'm so worn out. I've got these three dogs and they're just wearing it. <laughs> really? Well, if it makes you feel any better, my wife takes care of 50 by herself every day. <laughs> yeah. 16 to 18 hours a day, seven days a week for 28 years, John. Oh, my God. That's insane. I mean, really, that's great. But I love the passion. I mean, that's a love. That is a love. That's great. It is. It is. Well, And, and, and so in addition to doing our dogs, yeah. We now, because I, my whole life is, was in the film business as a, a performer, um, my wife and I have a wonderful opportunity. We are going to be into, in film production. We're actually taking gentle giants. There's, we have a character named Gentle, a giant Great Dane, and, and Giant, which is a little chihuahua named Giant with their yeah. fighting outfits. They're, and we're going to do some TV programming, families, kind of like Batman style, you know, but state of the art, 3D animation. We have our five acre estate <coughs> with uh, <clears throat> uh, a, uh, our own animation recording studio here. It's about 2000 square feet. We're building our own sound stage right now. We'll be able to do uh, state of the art digital programming, you know, virtual reality, things like that. And, and we're doing that and we've got our dogs as company, you what know. A great idea. So, and, and our dogs are so happy. I mean, they all cuddle and they all, everybody gets along. We don't have any fights, you know, and if people go to our website, they can watch videos of our dogs doing something that the most experienced trainers say they've never seen. Our dogs, because we, we elevate the food, that's part of very important, always elevate. There's certain height for every breed. Okay, you want to have it for each dog. You have to have it where the dog just tilts their head. You don't want them leaning down. But we have videos of our on our website of our dogs standing shoulder to shoulder like cows eating out of a trough nobody fighting everybody wow. gets along and i've had trainers say to me how did you do that we could never do that with dogs they're they're shoulder to shoulder you know wow. and and um, everybody gets along and when you have a nourishing environment everybody does better you know yeah they're we, 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 we do things and our animals are, they love each other. They don't only just love us. They love each other. They groom each other. They cuddle together. That is the most dangerous thing in our house, by the way, is to try to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night when you've got 50 <laughs> dogs in your bedroom. They don't sleep apart. They, they come close together because oh they like the body God. of each other. And I have to literally, if I want to go to the restroom, I got to get up, get to the closest wall. And, and work my way, careful where I put my foot. Oh, my God. Let me tell you something. It's easy to trip over them. They're not going to get hurt. I'm going to get hurt. They're Are bigger. They? And, and, I, and trying to get to the bathroom and get back. Oh, my. What a, what a deal that is, you know. Are they snoring, by the way, when, when you're doing that? You know? And I tease my wife, Tracy, you got to stop snoring. I don't snore, Bert. <laughs> yes, but, but I tease her. You know what I mean? And it's, of course. They, well, they're also loving and and, you, and, and their heads, I mean, I've got dogs, English Massive, I mean, that are three times the size of my head. Oh, they're yeah, no, no, huge. I know. Yeah, they're I know how big those dogs are. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know? I mean, and they come play with you. They don't just, like, grab your wrist. They grab your shoulder. Oh, I mean, my you God. have to understand when the, when the mouth grabs on your shoulder. Play. Oh, man. <laughs> it, well, it, you learn balance. That's another thing. All of these breeds have one thing in common. The giant breeds, they lean against you. And people say to me, well, oh, is there something wrong with their balance? No, they do that out of love. They want their fur touching your skin. Oh, that's cool. It. And you you have to relearn your balance. Let me tell you, you have to really be balanced because otherwise you'll fall over the first one that comes leaning against you. <laughs> that's funny. Well, I think it's amazing, that the Gentle Giants. I think it's really cool that you're incorporating it into the, um, the you know, uh, your own production company because it – Obviously, with your background with Robin and then the, the dogs doing like a, a superhero aspect with the dogs and it's your own, you and your wife will own it. Um, I love it. That's just that. Well, just, it, it's for smart. charity. We're not going to take any money from that either. This is all about wanting to leave this planet better off than we found it and wow. to try to just 
just make a better world for all of us. You know, that's that's all we want to do. And and, you know, uh, we stay away. From, we have nothing to do with politics. You know, yeah, yeah. It, no matter you could have the Hatfields and the McCoys and everybody mad at each other. But right. guess what? They all love their pets. Exactly. <laughs> we love animals. You know what I mean? And, and uh, in fact, uh, there's a saying that a dog is man's best friend because he wags his tail instead of his tongue. Wow. And uh, wow. so we, our, our animals, we love them so much. And then and, and the people that, that come to us, regardless of where they are, what they do, whatever, they know that we're going to help them and, and we only want the best for their animals. We do everything we can to keep our animals really healthy and everybody else's too. Very cool. Well, Bert, thanks a bunch for being on the show. I love talking with you. I really did. And, uh, you know, I'm a big kid, uh, you know, I, and I feel, I feel that from you and it's just, it's just been really fun. So, um, I wish you all the success in the world with gentle giants and all the good you're doing. And, and, um, hopefully at some point, maybe, maybe I'll see you at one of these, uh, you know, well, either that or you'll be out in Southern California. We'll bring you over here. Uh, don't wear your nicest clothes. <laughs> and we'll put you among 50 giants and then and, and watch you have some fun. All right. I may take you up on that. We'll, we'll see. All right. Well, thanks a bunch, Bert. I really appreciate you. Oh, my pleasure. And as we said on Batman, to the Batmobile. I love it. I love it. All right. Thanks again. All right, take care. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button in the corner of the video and the notification bell so you can be notified when I release my next episode. Enjoy.